SJC 12733, Commonwealth B. Joel Quiles. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Good Sam. afternoon, uh, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. As a result of a highly unusual sequence of events that occurred at the end of this trial, starting with the jury's uh, initial effort to return a verdict on the murder indictment, the defendant's conviction for felony murder armed robbery must be vacated for two different reasons. First, that conviction was predicated on an invalid predicate offense. When the jury came back with that initial verdict, it had been asked a special question. Did the defendant assault anyone other than the decedent? It answered that question, no. Assault, of course, is a necessary element of armed robbery. So by making that specific finding, the jury necessarily uh, made any predicate offense involving armed robbery and those other individuals who were in the house during this incident uh, not a viable predicate offense. But what about the uh, armed robbery involving Semedo? Well, with respect to armed robbery involving Semedo, Your Honor, uh, there was no evidence at trial that there was any armed robbery from Semedo, and the Commonwealth has conceded in its brief that there was insufficient armed robbery. And that's because the element of taking is missing. Well, that's correct, Your Honor, and that is an element. A so, so, element. so, assuming that I agree with you, and it seems like you're right, the Commonwealth has conceded that point. Why isn't it not? Why is it insufficient to say that there was an attempted armed robbery, given that the other elements were there? And the theory of the case, it seems to me, from the closing arguments, were that they tried to get the money from Semedo. Well, that, that's the Commonwealth's argument, Your Honor. And yeah, I know. I'm trying to figure out what your response is. Okay, well, there are several responses. First, Your Honor, as in Commonwealth versus Scott, which is, I submit, directly on point, this case, the predicate that was charged in this case, the only predicate was armed robbery, not attempted armed robbery. That is a very distinction that this court pointed to in Scott. Uh, so it was not a predicate that the Commonwealth uh, set forth that they asked for a jury instruction on. They didn't ask for it to be on the jury slip. The jury was not given attempted armed robbery as a alternative predicate offense. But they, uh, they were though, just to clarify, instructed that the, in order to convict the defendant of felony murder, they could find that he attempted to do the predicate offense. Well, Your Honor, that, that is part of the definition under the statute of felony murder. So that is always, it always reads during the commission or attempted commission. But as in Scott, it wasn't, that was not their theory. I mean, if you look at the closing argument, the, the prosecutor said, what's the felony? Holding people up at gunpoint. They, they, they never asked for an instruction specifically on attempted armed robbery. They never asked for that to be on the verdict slip. And, 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 there, and, and moreover, Your Honor- oh, Wait I mean, a second. You, this court it cannot, was never on the verdict slip? No, Your Honor. The verdict slip says armed robbery. It oh, I see, yes. Armed yes, yes, yes. But eventually they get the attempt instruction. Well, eventually, Your Honor, the fourth time after instructing the jury for the fourth time, the Commonwealth at the very end said, oh, could you please instruct them on attempt? And the, the judge did give a generic instruction on attempt. Right, was, but the, the, the statutory definition, as you said, you may think it's boilerplate, but the statutory definition he gives throughout and then based upon which, and I agree with you, Mr. Sultan, the, the procedure is haywire, but at the very end, he does properly instruct on the elements of an attempt and he's convicted after well, that instruction, correct? Your Honor, he tells them what attempt is. It's a generic instruction on attempt. It's not an instruction on attempt at armed robbery. He doesn't specify any possible overt acts. And basically what the, what the Commonwealth wants the court to do is to take the jury's verdict, which is felony murder armed robbery and try to essentially uh, figure out what the jury must have been thinking. That's not, I mean, under under 
Plunkett and that whole line of cases, uh, it, it, you, you're not supposed to try to figure out if there are alternative predicates and some of them are inadequate. It is not for this court to try to figure out, well, this is the one they probably relied on. Uh, it's gotta be necessary and unavoidable. It wasn't necessary and unavoidable here. The cases where- Is that a due process issue, Mr. Uh, Sultan, as far as notice? Well, it, it is a new process issue, Your Honor, because, because uh, and, and the fact that it was not, that the Commonwealth did not ask for an attempted armed robbery as a predicate, did not ask for that to be listed on the, on the, on the verdict slip. Of course, the defense counsel uh, is dealing with the case as presented, is dealing with the case as argued. When they, when they, and, and, and I don't have this at, uh, on my fingertips. What did Mr. How did Mr. Darrell defend the case, uh, Mr. Sultan, as, as far as, because I, I, I get your point that Judge Chin's verdict slipped, um, had some failures as far as the assault to anyone. He, it could have been a lot clearer, but, um, and the government argued essentially they were assaulting all these other people and, and the jury didn't buy that. What did the defense argue? What was the defense? The defense of trial, Your Honor. Yeah, I guess the first defense, right? What was the, what was the well, defense? Well, the defense was that the two witnesses who basically uh, identified uh, Kiles uh, as being the perpetrator or a primary perpetrator, uh, Talos Francisco uh, and uh, uh, Kiera, uh, the woman who was kind of playing both sides, were not credible witnesses. That was, that was the thrust of the defense. And obviously, if the jury had bought everything these witnesses had said, they presumably would have convicted the defendant on, on, more, on more counts and on more theories. But again, I don't want to play that game either of trying to psychoanalyze what the jury must have been thinking. The Commonwealth chose to try this case the way they chose to try it. They could have asked for attempted armed robbery of the tomato right. as theory. They could have asked for that to be on the verdict. Attorney verse. Sultan, Attorney Sultan, I, I understand your point. And I just, if you, putting aside everything, get handed me ver the verdict slips that exist now, after all, everything was said and done, what would I conclude from looking at all of those verdict slips? Well, Your Honor, what you would conclude uh, is that the jury made a, a specific finding that nobody else was assaulted and they ultimately returned a verdict of felony murder armed robbery when there was no basis to find that Mr. Keeley's had committed any armed robbery. And under Scott, that theory shouldn't have gone to the jury at all. Now the court can try to say, well, they must have been thinking about attempted armed robbery of Semedo, and you know that's close enough. That's not how this system works. I mean, there is, due, as Justice Gaziano says, there are due process concerns here. So could you address the case law that says that an absence of a finding isn't a finding and, and, and makes uh, the issue still live? Well, I agree with that. I mean, that case law has been, uh, Car uh, Carlino has been recently reaffirmed by this court. And I, I'm, not, I'm not here to quarrel with that. They, they have every right to retry Mr. Keeley's for uh, deliberate premeditation, first degree murder, and extreme atrocity or cruelty, first degree murder. Those two theories, you're right, Your Honor, they were blanked under this court's precedent. That's not a verdict. They can retry him on those theories. They cannot retry him on the theory of felony murder armed robbery because there was insufficient evidence based on the jury's fact finding and based on the lack of a taking from Semedo that the defendant committed an armed robbery of anyone. Are you, are you, so you're saying basically the first verdict acted as an acquittal because of, of straight arm robbery. And then it's a due process violation to add in all the attempts. Well, I, I don't think you can have attempted armed robbery without an assault either. I, I mean, I, I, uh, right. And well, no, assault someone other than the victim. Right. Sorry, that, they, yeah, they, 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 so they found that the victim was assaulted, I guess, if you, you do, the, if you do the, the double negative, correct? The jury did find that, that, that the decedent was, was assaulted. That's right, correct. Right. So they, they found that, and that would fit into the attempted on robbery if there was no taken from his person, correct? If the, if the Commonwealth had, had tried the case on the theory of attempted armed robbery or tomato, if that had been on the verdict slip, 
If you ask me, was there sufficient evidence by which the jury could have convicted him? The answer is probably yes. Okay. But, but we can't. No, I, 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 case is tried. No, I, I take your point that the government is stuck with the theory they write, write in with. But if 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 it was a pristine um, verdict slip and, and the judge had instructed the felony murder could be attempted armed robbery um, and then the armed home invasion would be the assaults on everybody else, you wouldn't be here arguing that point. Well, I think he had to, Your Honor, once they came back with that special finding, the judge had to do more than that because the judge had to take certain predicates explicitly off the table by not saying anything to them about the impact of that special finding, he left open a whole bunch of different potential predicates, which were clearly invalid. And we don't know that the jury didn't rely on any of those clearly invalid predicates. And under Plunkett and Fregata and those cases- Can I ask Mr. Sol- you, you have to get ran a new trial. Mr. Solon, what is the significance- Mr. 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 Solon, what is the significance He's convicted of armed assault with intent to rob Sumedo, right? Yes, Your Honor. And that what what that can't be a predicate for felony murder. Why? Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I understand that part of this. It can't be a predicate for felony murder because it's not a life felony. Okay, it's and not a life felony. After okay. Brown, it's not second degree felony murder. So that's not that can't be the predicate. If okay. if if that were a life felony, I wouldn't be here. Because that, then the case would be just like cases like Blackwell and Barry, where this court has said, look, the jury convicted on the underlying life felony, therefore it's a valid felony murder conviction. So so is attempted armed robbery a life felony? Attempt, well, attempt is not, no, attempted armed robbery. Right, is so, not a life so I guess that's my question then. If Scott is right, <laughs> uh, or the way you're interpreting Scott is correct. I, I don't understand how somebody could be found guilty of felony murder if the predicate must be attempted armed robbery, if that's not a life felony. Because, it's, uh, because, the, because the statute, because 265.1, I think, says that, uh, uh, that a, a killing that occurs during the commission or attempted commission of a life felony. Right, and so the and predicate has to be armed robbery, not attempted armed robbery. The life felony has to be armed robbery. And then it's the jury's determination as to whether they only attempted to do it or he actually committed it. You're right, Your Honor. The, the underlying felony is armed robbery. Right, so why does the verdict slip have to say attempted armed robbery? Because that is a specific theory which would support the return of a first degree felony murder verdict, and that's not the way this case was tried. It was not presented to the jury that way. The Commonwealth didn't ask it to be presented to the jury that way. It's different from some other cases where that particular theory is presented to the jury. And can you tell explicitly. us, can you remind me of our case law, Mr. Sultan, on that, where we've never said that you have to have a separate indictment Right, to, to, to support the, no, the uh, felony. Have to be so so, have so to be what, at all. right, so what does our case law say, Mr. Sultan, as far as notice and what goes properly to the jury uh, to, to, to get that instruction? Well, Your Honor, I think, I, I mean, frankly, the, the best case is really Scott. And the, the language in Scott, which I quoted in my brief, is really quite clear. It says, the predicate felony asserted by the Commonwealth in this case was armed robbery, not attempted armed robbery. And then it goes on to say, if at a retrial, the Commonwealth adduces sufficient evidence to support a finding of armed robbery, then the jury may return a verdict of a felony murder in the right. first degree. But it then it goes on to say, if the Commonwealth does not adduce sufficient evidence to warrant a finding of armed robbery, a felony murder charge obviously could not be put to the jury on the basis of armed robbery on that predicate felony. In, in, in your argument that the boilerplate language, the, when the judge reads, you know, felony or attempted commission of a felony, coupled with the final instruction on attempt, doesn't cut it. Right. It's got to. It's got to be. It's got. It's got to be an instruction on attempted armed robbery. It has to make clear that that is the predicate. That's what Scott says. It's got to say the predicate charge here, or the theory of the Commonwealth. Is attempted armed robbery. And remind me, I thought that the um, discussion about 
that led Judge Chin to give the attempt had to do with the armed robbery? Well, no, all, well, what he said is, uh, with he said with respect to felony murder, and then he gave a generic, a generic definition of attempt. He did not tie it to armed robbery. He did not talk about overt acts relating to armed robbery. It was a generic attempt instruction. Uh, that's all that it was. And I mean, to cobble that together with this verdict slip and somehow say the jury was presented with this theory in a clear fashion is, is just to, uh, to change what happened. I mean, process is important. It's never more important than in a first degree murder case. This process cannot justify a first degree murder conviction. It just, yeah. it just can't. Attorney and, and Sultan, I, yes, understand, I understand your argument and I understand there's a case that says you can, you can do what the judge did in terms of sending somebody back. But if you're the, if I'm the juror, how am I going to interpret the judge sending me back to reevaluate something? Well, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question, Your Honor, because that really goes to the second ground why this conviction cannot stand. And that is because the judge through his course of conduct basically led the jury improperly to return a first degree murder conviction. And I'm not suggesting that the coercion was overt. I'm not suggesting there was any uh, uh, improper intent on the judge's part. But if you look at the sequence of events, they come back with the first verdict. He says, this is not a valid first degree murder conviction, verdict. He sends them out to, to deliberate further solely on second degree with a, a new verdict slip. They spend an hour deliberating on second degree only. Then the next morning, he completely reverses course, says that was a mistake. Go back and deliberate further on first degree, including felony murder, armed robbery. And by the way, here's a, here's a little instruction on attempt, just to give you a little roadmap of how you can get there. And what that communicated, I submit your honor, it is telling a jury, not directly, but indirectly, you messed up yesterday in returning your first degree murder verdict. You can fix your mistake by returning another first degree murder verdict. Mm -hmm. And by the way, here's how to do it. Now, does it matter in your analysis there that the judge actually said, I made a mistake yesterday, sending you back with a second degree murder? Not you made a mistake. Well, I think it would, it would have been worse if he said you made a mistake, but, but, but the, what he's communicating is, Whoever made the mistake, he told them originally they made a mistake because he said, this is not a valid first degree murder conviction. The mistake he said he made was sending them out only on second degree. And, and so what's communicated to them is, this is what we're supposed to do. They come back an hour later. And just last week in a, in a case, this court said that in, in evaluating coercion, uh, whether or not something was coercive, it's important to look at how much time passed well, here, it was, I think, 55 minutes or an hour or 65 minutes. I forget exactly what it was, but it was essentially an hour between that instruction and the verdict. And I think that reinforces that this course of conduct was unwittingly coercive. And, you know, the judge was faced with a tough problem. I mean, some of you have been trial judges. You've been in that position when something unexpected happens. He did the best he can, but what he did does not comport with due process. And uh, I asked the court to vacate the conviction and remand it for a new trial. Thank you, uh, Attorney Thank Sultan. You, Attorney Black. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, ADA Johanna Black for the Commonwealth. I'm just gonna briefly touch on Justice Gaziano's question about fair notice. Um, the defendant provided the murder indictment in his record appendix, um, I believe, it is page 18 of his record appendix. And the Commonwealth submits that the indictment in that form is sufficient fair notice under due process um, as to the murder indictment or the murder charge. Now, as everyone knows, the Commonwealth can proceed under any of those three theories, felony murder, extreme atrocity or cruelty or uh, deliberate premeditation. And I think, um, essentially just the indictment itself answers the due process question of whether the defendant had fair notice of that charge. Um, again- But the, the, the indictment just says, every indictment says did assault and beat, right? Right, and that's been held to be sufficient. 
Right. Well, I mean, that's sufficient to give give notice that there's a that, that there's a murder indictment, but um, you couldn't ask the judge to instruct on carjacking. I mean, it has to be there has to be a predicate felony that that's that that right. that's announced to the defendant. Correct. Well, when that predicate. happens is a matter of, I guess, relative. It's relative, but you, the defendant has to know what felony he or she is defending. Correct. Right. No, that's true. Um, I think the case law that shows a predicate felony does not have to be charged also right. weighs in the Commonwealth's favor. Here, I think the defendant would learn that information, which predicate felonies the Commonwealth was proceeding on during discovery. It's always up to them if they'd like to request a bill of particulars. And what, Here, was, that, what was that predicate felony? At trial, the Commonwealth um, stated them as armed robbery and armed- Wasn't it armed robbery of the other two victims? No, I think- if you look at the Commonwealth's opening and closing and the evidence they presented, the way in which they presented it, it was clear to the jury that the Commonwealth is moving on the attempted armed robbery of the victim. Um, I think what matters in this case, and I know there's a lot of discussion about, um, about whether armed assault with intent to rob qualifies as a predicate felony that would raise, I'm being wordy, but raise murder up to first degree under Brown or whether um, attempted robbery does, or whether it's only armed robbery. And the case law um, is consistent. And there's a long line in the history of case law that attempted armed robbery is a sufficient predicate offense for first degree felony murder. Brown did not change that. In fact, Brown um, was convicted of uh, the predicate attempted armed robbery under a joint venture theory. This court reduced his conviction under 33E in the light of the facts being that he wasn't at the scene, he provided a gun and I believe two it, sweatshirts. It, it, as, as I looked at the charge conference, the judge said, I'm going to instruct on armed robbery. I think he he was talking about the decedent and then armed assault. And that's when he raised the merger issues and which led him to the special questions that, that went awry. Um, the charge then becomes premeditation, atrocity, cruelty, felony murder, armed robbery and or armed home invasion. Um, other than the boilerplate language, he never says anything, and there's no discussion about attempted armed robbery or instruction on that. Right. Did, did the prosecutor argue, it was explain away the, the lack of a taking to say it was an attempted armed robbery? Um, did she explain away? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the theory of the case. Is, was it an armed robbery or an attempted armed robbery? That's what I'm trying to. Get it. Right. I think um, we indicted the defendant for two armed robberies, one of Al's, one of Gomes. The jury found um, unanimously that he was not guilty of either. We proceeded on the theory. Our primary theory of the case was that the defendant wanted, he intended to rob the victim, but he failed. And that um, is interesting with predicate felonies because the named predicate felony, as you said in this case, was armed robbery. That is the felony that we were asserting justifies a conviction of first degree murder. That was a felony we were asserting the defendant intended to commit against Jonathan, Jonathan Semido all along from February through the night he died. And I think, um, as I said, Cannon, Houston, um, Brown, Evans, dating back to I think the 1980s, attempted armed robbery sufficient, even though attempt itself as a crime is not punishable by life in prison. Have, have the we attempted ever, commission of the predicate felony. Have, have we ever said that um, an instruction that just gives the boilerplate uh, f definition of felony murder without an instruction on attempt is sufficient? No, is but um, that I could find, no. But there is the case Mandeal that was cited in both of our briefs. In that case, um, as far as I could find from the facts that were cited, the court uh, instructed the jury on statutory murder. So um, felony murder may be a uh, killing that occurs in the commission or attempted commission of a felony, maybe felony murder. Um, and then it was, and it seems like that was the only instruction that was given, unlike our case, where the judge did ultimately instruct on attempt. And I don't think he could have been any more specific because there is no specific definition of an overt act in terms of attempted armed robbery. It could be one of many things. So where the timing of the instruction in light of the instructions he gave along with it, um, I think that shows the jury knew the only charge that the attempt instruction was applicable to, especially having been instructed that felony murder is a killing that it can occur in the attempted commission of a predicate felony would have been the predicate armed robbery. Um, and I think that case distinguishes this, distinguishes this case from Mandeal where it appears from the facts of that case that the 
court only gave the statutory uh, instruction that felony murder is a killing and the commission or attempt to commission of a crime. Here, the jury got that as well as what attempt means. And I don't think that there's a specific attempted armed robbery instruction to give where many different acts can be an overt act. You can define what an overt act is, but not necessarily in the context of what it's going to be for a particular crime each and every time that crime is committed. So um, can I ask you to address uh, Council Sultan's point that the sequence of events became coercive? Sure. And not that there was any intent to coerce the jury, but uh, you know that's an invalid uh, verdict. Uh, go back on second degree. Oh, uh, oops, I made a mistake. Uh, here's an instruction on attempt, even though I never gave that to you before. Why is that not a, a, a direction to the verdict to the jury to come back with the verdict that they ultimately came back with within an hour? So, I think that the judge. The case law shows that a judge is entitled to state the law as is. And that's what Judge Chin did. He made a mistake. He was entitled before a verdict is rendered um, or returned and recorded, I should say, um, to correct any mistakes and to make sure that the jury's given the correct and applicable law. And that's what he did. Um, the What's your best case for the proposition that this scenario is not coercive? So I named a number of cases in my brief, but I think the best case, um, I could just have a brief minute. It's difficult for me to pick one because I think when you look at the principle stated in a number of cases and, and apply them to what happened here, it shows that it was not coercive, but let me try to find the best case. And I'm sorry, I don't have this off the top of my head for you. Uh, would your honor consider the Commonwealth filing a 16 L letter with it? Actually. No, if it's just okay. something that's in your brief, I can find it. I can find it myself. I, did, I just thought if you I knew did, offhand. I did list a number of cases. I think sure this do. case um, just is distinguishable from Zacharias um, because if you read Judge Chin's words and his explanations for why instructions were coming when they came, it shows that he's, it wasn't coercive, that he was just simply stating the law and why they're now getting this law. And I think because the jury initially convicted the defendant on armed home invasion, armed robbery wasn't necessarily the focus of their deliberations at that point. It became the focus of their deliberations once merger rendered their initial first degree murder conviction invalid. Um, so I'll just move on to um, just back to the armed robbery, attempted armed robbery, armed assault with intent to rob um, issues. I did cite Blackwell in my brief as a reason why um, what happened in this case um, did not prejudice the defendant. Um, I think the case of Commonwealth versus Berry, B-E-R-R-Y 420 Math 95, specifically pages 110 to 112. It's a 1995 case I did not cite in my brief, I realized, um, but that also lends support. Uh, that was a case where a defendant uh, was convicted of uh, first degree murder, a general verdict, as well as burglary with, burglary with actual assault. And the court found that it was not plausible to conclude that the jury found Barry committed the assault, which consisted of the stabbing that killed the victim, but did not find the stabbing cause the victim's death. And the SJC there, uh, this court there concluded unavoidably the jury unanimously found felony murder when they were trying to figure out which theory the jury based their general verdict on. And similar to that case, the defendant here was convicted unanimously of armed assault of Jonathan with intent uh, to rob Jonathan. And he was also committed of, uh, convicted of felony murder of Jonathan. So the jury found that the defendant killed Jonathan and they found that he assaulted Jonathan with an intent to rob him. And just like in Barry, it's not plausible to think that um, the stabbing that caused the victim's death in this case was um, that it was, um, sorry, that the stabbing that they, that 
I'm not phrasing this correctly. It's just, I think when you um, compare this, the facts of this case to that in Barry, it's not plausible to think that the jury based their felony murder conviction on the defendant's acts against the other occupants of the apartment where they found that the stabbing killed Jonathan and that that stabbing was a part of the defendant's attempt to rob Jonathan. It's not plausible to think that um, they would have based their felony murder conviction on his acts with respect to the others in the apartment. Jonathan Semito, the victim, deceased victim, wasn't even in the room at the time uh, the defendant was alleged to have committed the acts against the other occupants. Um, I think the Benitez, B-E-N-I-T-E-Z case, um, it shows that uh, armed assault with intent to rob is a lesser included offense of armed robbery. And the Lodetto case that I cite in my brief shows that on certain facts, armed assault with intent to rob is equivalent to attempted armed robbery, which although attempt crimes aren't punishable by life in prison, then when you attempt to commit a predicate felony that is punishable by life in prison, you can be convicted of first degree felony murder. And here, like Lodetto, the facts show that the assault was an overt act. The armed assault with intent to rob Jonathan also qualified as an overt act for an attempted armed robbery of Jonathan. So when, like in Lodetto on these facts, armed assault with intent to rob Jonathan is equivalent to attempted armed robbery of Jonathan. And it is confusing that attempt itself isn't punishable by life imprisonment, but if you attempt a felony that is, you can be convicted of first degree murder if someone dies. I think what that shows is the intent that someone has to commit the predicate felony that is punishable by life imprisonment is significant. And that's um, a major reason why they are held culpable of first degree murder, of liable for first degree murder. And here, all day long, the defendant intended to rob, to commit an armed robbery of Jonathan. He just failed in doing it. Um, and I'm just gonna go over my outline very quickly. I also do think that um, the McGrath case provides support for, it isn't so much about um, the name of the predicate felony. It's about the facts and the intention of the defendant what felony he intended to commit. Um, the McGrath case that I cited in my brief, they weren't sure whether the defendants committed an attempted armed robbery or an armed robbery. Um, but the defendant there was uh, convicted of first degree murder and that was upheld. Um, I think the, uh, the Brown case in reading the footnotes and the, um, and I know Justice Gaziano was a major part of that decision. Um, I do think that it lends support for the instruction on armed robbery because that was the predicate felony that triggered the liability for first degree murder. And the jury were told that they didn't have to find the defendant completed the armed robbery. He could, they could find he just attempted it. And then and when you read the felony, other felony murder instructions, it's, there's, there's heavy emphasis on intent. Um, I think the cases also, I think it's the Holly case, uh, the recent Holly case, I think it's 2017, is the one that says um, the killing can occur before or after the completion of the predicate felony. I think that also lends support that felony murder isn't something um, that I, that I almost, I don't know how to phrase this properly, but it's more about intent than maybe um, and the evidence and what the evidence showed than specifically about, um, like in this case, the fact that it was armed robbery on the verdict. And, the, and I think that the defendant's not prejudiced by that. I mean, we definitely could have put attempted armed robbery on the verdict slip and um, that might've saved some headaches, but this court has the authority if you want to reduce the predicate felony to attempted armed robbery and the defendant is still liable for first degree murder. His conviction should still be affirmed. Attempted armed robbery is a lesser included offense of robbery, armed robbery, and the evidence was sufficient of that. Um, I, I do wanna just um, point out two things in defendant's reply brief, 
he claimed the Commonwealth made um, an argument that the defendant commanded Jonathan to empty his pockets out of whole cloth. Um, the maybe um, if the Commonwealth provides some more pages in its citation, it would uh, render the evidence supporting that claim clearer. Um, those pages would be uh, pages 112 to 117 of transcript four. Um, if you read those pages, it's it's clear that Gomes is speaking of all three, including the defendant approached on Smito and ordered him to empty his pockets. Um, but in any event, Commonwealth didn't have to prove that the defendant specifically said that to Jonathan as it was a joint venture theory. Um, and additionally, in transcript two, during Arias's testimony, um, pages 188 through 196, and particularly on page 192, she uh, names the person she's speaking of as PC, but it's from the context, it's um, clear that she's speaking of Jonathan Semito. And that also lends support for the Commonwealth's claim um, that the defendant ordered Jonathan Semito to empty his pockets. Um, but again, it was a joint venture theory and the evidence um, including it was the defendant's plan to rob the victim. He was the one who gathered his friends. He went in and grabbed clothes and shoes with his friends. Um, he found out who the victim was with, Johnson, who Jonathan Semito was with, found out where Jonathan, Jonathan Semito was. He got everyone to where Jonathan went. He got everyone inside the apartment where Jonathan was. He ordered his buddies to rob everyone, which he knew included Jonathan. Um, he kept the knife that he had obtained to gain entry to the apartment after he entered the apartment. Um, and he approached Jonathan with that knife while his co-venturer held a gun to Jonathan demanding he empty his pockets. If you don't find the defendant himself was demanding that. And then if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, looks like we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Your Honors.